Thank you. Right. So that that means at least to you, the presentation will be useful. That that is amazing. Well, it's it's nice to see um, all of you in chat and and who are you where you're from. So thank you for that. I. I really um, enjoyed this kind of interactivity, uh, which, as I said, is really hard to achieve uh, through this. So thank you for uh, for this. Um, well, when I um, started, and, and when I said to my colleague that I'm going to do this presentation, um, this is what what he told me. He told me that 30% of people are actually sending texts during presentation, and then I said, I know that statistics, and that 40% are okay occasionally also answering their emails and then he replied that 20 percent are actually falling asleep well i said i hope that at least for 10 percent uh, my presentation will be useful and he said i'm too optimistic and that actually only five percent of people find online presentations useful i uh, which means that out of 30 of you, I have one and a half person or so will, will find it useful. Well, I hope it's going to be more uh, than that. Uh, so um, as I said, feel free to interrupt me at any time. And if you think something is not clear enough, I'm, I'm happy to explain it and to make it more interactive. Um, well, I started, I decided to start with a bit of a personal story, just so um, maybe you'll, you'll feel um, Harder to you 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 won't fall asleep um, if you get to know me a bit a bit better. So um, my name is Bojana Klepac Pogremilovic, and um, at least I was called like that until around four years ago. But then I got an idea to study abroad, uh, and well, went all the way from Croatia to Australia. In Australia, I was called Bojana, 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 uh, all these weird names, and I don't even want to go into how my surnames were pronounced. Um, and then I became Bo, because I decided to reduce my 23 letter name to a two letter name. And this is how um, that came to being with, uh, which was good because nobody really uh, mispronounced it so far. So Bo, Bo is fine. So I'm happy for you to also call me Bo. Um, and uh, as I said, I went to Australia to do my PhD at Victoria University for four years. Um, and after four years of researching physical activity and sedentary behavior policies, I have to say I was a bit sad because I thought I'm going to get deported from Australia and I won't be able to stay. Luckily, I got an opportunity to stay at the Mitchell Institute, which is also part of Victoria University. And um, I got a full-time job for two years, and I still feel lucky and grateful that I'm being a, that I work because a lot of people in this sector, um, as you may know, uh, was affected by by the coronavirus. So uh, I was lucky enough not to be there. So we we started with um, a bit of introduction and why is this is this relevant or could be relevant and um, where the colleague from Mexico had a nice uh, nice few words about it. So I believe that this research could be relevant to you for a few reasons. So as we saw with COVID-19, um, during lockdown, a lot of us was really on their own skin witnessing and, and some of you are still witnessing it, how government policies can really change our lives and can influence our lives on a daily basis. Uh, they can literally lock you up and forbid you to, to go to do things that you took for granted, such as taking a walk or, or going to a park. So whether we like it or not, policies shape our lives every day. And uh, we as researchers can influence policy, hopefully, and decision-making. And policy research apparently is, and I believe so, is crucial for achieving uh, reforms in public health. Um, so before I go any further, I do know that you are all well informed, but I just thought let's just shortly um, check this, these two definitions on the screen, because uh, we will be talking about them. So we're all on the same page of what, what we mean by physical activity and sedentary behavior. 
Um, I will come to the title of my presentation, which is National Physical Activity and Sanitary Behavior Policies in 76 Countries, but I would like to guide you through the four studies, and I promise I'll be short, just to let you know and just to show you how we came to that study and why we decided to, to conduct it. Um, so the first study that I did in, as part of my PhD was the Global Systematic Scoping Review of Studies Analyzing National Physical Activity and Sedentary Behavior Policies. And I have to be honest, before I came to Australia, I never heard about systematic literature reviews. We would do usually narrative literature reviews in political science. So I'm, I'm, my background is political science. And in Croatia, that wasn't really popular. People at least uh, did, didn't really do it there a lot. So when my supervisor suggested I do a systematic literature review of studies that analyze physical activity and sedentary behavior policies, he said it's a new research area and that it's not going to be a lot of work. Uh, because we may end up finding around 30 studies maximum. So after 24,000 screen references, and it was a lot of those because we used a really extensive and broad search syntax, we found 203 studies and we included all of them. We included, uh, sorry, we found more, but we included 203 studies. And uh, we ended up summarizing research fund studies for 168 countries um, because my supervisor thought it would be a brilliant idea, which ended up being a huge 60 page table, which is additional file to this, uh, to this study. And at that time, uh, I was really overwhelmed with the research and was questioning sort of my decision of, about doing PhD and coming to Australia. But then Luckily, we did some, some cool things like this map that thought, okay, maybe, uh, maybe we are doing something good for the whole area. So what we found is that uh, in those studies marked red, uh, there, were none, there were no studies about physical activity and sanitary behavior policies, which, uh, which we thought is a shame because uh, we, we don't know much still about some of these countries in terms of their national physical activity and sanitary behavior policies. Uh, studies um, marked pink, we found one study, dark green uh, two to four studies, light green 10 to 14 studies, and um, um, countries marked, uh, sorry, countries marked dark green, I, we found uh, 15 or more studies and gray two to four and five to nine studies. So you can immediately see that in high income countries, Western and Northern Europe, um, North America and Australia, we found most research about um, national physical activity and sanitary behavior policies. Um, so the main findings were that P physical activity policy is actually more developed than it was thought because previously uh, there were some claims that it's underdeveloped, but we found a lot of studies, so it, it wasn't as underdeveloped as thought. However, central behavior policy we found was still in infancy, just a few studies um, included sanitary behavior policies and only one um, analyzed sanitary behavior policies independently of physical activity policies. Um, obviously lack of research in low and middle income countries as I showed at the map. And then we found interestingly that not a lot of studies included definitions of physical activity policies. So they analyzed them, but they didn't define them. And those that did define physical activity policies um, defined them in different ways. So the definitions of physical activity policies were inconsistent. And also very few studies were based on theoretical or conceptual frameworks. Which led us to the second study. Um, to the development of a comprehensive analysis of uh, policy of physical activity framework. So that's how we got uh, an initial idea to um, develop the COPPA framework. So besides the big systematic uh, scoping review, we conducted an additional literature review and search for available frameworks. We conducted a Delphi decisional process uh, to develop the framework and its building blocks. And after we had a draft of the framework, we consulted with key stakeholders to advise us on the finalization of the framework. So, um, which included physical activity researchers, um, people who worked in the private sector, also advocacy, uh, policymakers, so 10, 10 stakeholders. Um, and we ended up with six categories and 38 
elements of the Kappa framework. So I'll show you the framework. So this is how it looks. Uh, so these are the six categories, uh, stage of policy cycle, scope of analysis, type of policy, policy level, purpose of analysis, and policy sector. So uh, we'll see how much time do we have. I don't want to go into too many details, but if you have any questions about any of those, uh, we, can, we can discuss them later. Um, as I mentioned, studies that analyze policies rarely defined um, what is policy. And I wouldn't blame them too much because policy is really hard to define and it can be an ambiguous term. So as I said, I would like to make this a bit more interactive. So I would be really curious uh, to know what comes to your mind um, when you think about policy. What, what is the key association or term, um, how do you perceive policy? So if you can put it in chat or even unmute yourself, that, that would be great because I'd be keen to know how you perceive it before I go and, and tell you what, what did we um, come up with in terms of definition. Maybe I start. <laughs> I'm okay. Sarah here. Hi. You, <laughs> to be honest, after working two or three years now in Penn, my first association <laughs> is in which sector are you working, actually? <laughs> it's intervention, it's organization, it's politics, it's <laughs> otherwise it's go really, really messy. <laughs> so I'm. Um... Okay, what do we have? Okay, actions and narrative for committed change. Reflection of commitment. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Thank you, Sarah, for uh, sharing this with us. It is, it is a bit messy as a political scientist. I can tell you there is no unified definition of policy. There are people cannot agree, political scientists, legislations and regulations. Yes, absolutely, that can be it. Well, in, yes, yeah, Sarah, did, did you want to say? I, I would not say that. There are definitions, but it really depends on which um, context we are working. For public, sign, uh, public politicians, public policy, it's clear. It's about regulation. It's about soft law, hard law, and all that is. And when it's go to intervention or organization, then it's the organizational policy, then the really um, how it's more in the context related. So it's the, that's the fun, actually. Yeah. Well, that's we, we tried to do that through a Kappa framework in terms of addressing different levels. So institutional, which is organizational policy, as you said, and then uh, national, subnational. Uh, so that's one aspect. And um, but a lot of a lot of people perceive it just as a written document, which can be you know soft or hard. Uh, which we thought it it's narrow because, uh, as Marie said in chat, it can also be government action or even not taking action. So it can be really broad. Um, uh, there there was a famous definition one by one political scientist that said oh, it can be whatever government chooses to do or not to do. So um, it can go in, in any direction, but we hope at least for physical activity research that we um, encompassize um, physical activity policy with this broad definition. Uh, so we defined it uh, within this consensus building process through developing of the Kappa framework. We defined physical activity policy as uh, that it is indicated by the totality of formal written policies. So that's what we talked about um, in terms of regulations, rules, laws, but then also unwritten formal statements, written guidelines and standards, formal procedures and informal policies or lack of, therefore, that may directly or indirectly affect community or population level physical activity. So we really wanted to to go broad and, and move away a little bit from that definition that's usually the easiest, which is concerned with formal written policies that, that governments produce to, to include um, this more broader definition. Then we were interested in um, instruments to analyze policy. So what is used, what kind of instruments and tools are used for analyzing physical activity and, and sedentary behavior policies? Um, and we conducted another systematic review, luckily with less included studies than that one with 203. Um, 
And we wanted to see um, what are the instruments used and, and what are their characteristics. So what are they actually wanting to analyze within those policies? So we screened 22,000 references. We included 26 studies and we found 16 instruments and those studies describe 16 instruments. So we categorize them and assess them according to the CUPA framework. And in terms of findings, I just uh, want to present a few ones, but as I said, if you wanted to dive into any of that, we can, we can talk about that a bit uh, deeper. What we found is that only two instruments included questions about sedentary behavior policies. So as I said, it is in infancy, uh, that research area comparing to physical activity policy research. We found that some important elements of physical activity policies were addressed only by a few instruments and none of the instruments addressed all elements of the CUPA framework. So then we decided to conduct um, an analysis, like a comprehensive analysis of national policies in as many countries as we could, but then it ended up being 76 and I'll tell you in a minute why and how. So that is the study uh, I want to talk uh, more about and, and go into a bit more details about uh, the findings. So um, national physical activity and sedentary behavior policies in 76 countries, we analyzed availability, comprehensiveness, implementation and effectiveness of policies. So this study was done in collaboration with Global Observatory for Physical Activity. Um, and I'm really grateful for them to, to uh, give me their platform of people who are collaborating with them all across the world. Um, so we invited 173 GOPA um, country contacts to participate in assessment of physical activity and sedentary behavior policies. And they are distinguished public health experts, researchers, or state officials in different countries uh, who are well informed about their country's physical activity and sedentary behavior policies, and then who um, collaborate with GOPA on developing GOPA country cards. So the response rate was 44%, and uh, we sent a questionnaire uh, to the country contacts through Qualtrics software. We developed a GOPA policy inventory, and I can tell you a bit more later why did we decide to develop a new um, instrument and why didn't we use any of the 16 that we found previously. So we can talk about that in, in the discussion. And, but yeah, we, we had a few, a few, re, few good reasons, we believe. Uh, we uh, undertook a pretty extensive process of the development of the inventory of that, uh, that new tool. It contains 20 questions. It was based on a health enhancing physical activity policy audit tool, HEPAPAT. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know about that one. And about, uh, also based on EU monitoring framework for physical activity across sector, and also on the CUPA framework. Uh, the tool is, if you ever want to use it, um, available as interactive Word document, um, and it's of a free to use, and it's an additional file in that um, paper that I'm, I'm talking about. So um, I can also send it to you, or you can just uh, follow this link. I won't go into details about the inventory, but this is uh, some of the main things and data that we collected from 76 countries. Um, so in terms of availability, what we found is that 92% of countries that we uh, had the data from had national policy documents. So formal written documents, legislation, strategies, or action plans that outline government's intention to increase physical activity. We did find significant differences in the availability of national policies, um, formal written policies between country groups, as you can see uh, on this graph and also between world regions. Uh, so there, there was a bit of discrepancy, but also we were really happy to find that 92% of countries had them, which wasn't the case with um, sedentary behavior policies, but it was still a, still a large percentage of countries that, that had, um, had them. In terms of uh, availability of guidelines, 62% um, had national guidelines for physical activity policies. 40% uh, had national guidelines for sedentary behavior. Quantifiable national targets were available in 52% of the countries, research countries. And um, 
quantifiable national tar targets for sedentary behavior only in 11% of, of countries. A surveillance system that includes measures of physical activity was available in 71% of the research countries and a surveillance system that includes sedentary behavior measures was available in 51% of the countries. In terms of comprehensiveness, and, and that was that was interesting um, aspect of the research, um, because I, I didn't find that anyone else was researching that before. Uh, we found that physical activity policy in 39% of the countries, um, that they include only around half of the elements that are considered important um, to, um, for, the, for the physical activity policy or sedentary behavior policy to have a comprehensive approach. And in 27% of the countries, um, they contain most of the important elements. So as you can see, not a lot of countries contained um, most important elements and no, no country said that uh, their policy covers all important elements. So in most of the included countries, as the sedentary behavior policy was assessed as having low comprehensiveness and covering no important aspect. Um, so also we, we found that the level of comprehensiveness was higher in high income countries, uh, as you can imagine. Um, these results are not visible in the graph, but they are in the, um, in the paper. So we can talk also about them um, later if you want. In terms of implementation, we assess the level of implementation for a total of 150 national physical activity and sedentary behavior policies. So in terms of um, the results, around 40% of those, they had around half of the statements within the policies implemented. Um, and for only 28% of the policies, um, most statements were implemented. So as, as, as you may know, um, a lot of the time we do have a policy that's not really bad, that's actually pretty good. It has targets, it has um, some plans for implementation, but then when it comes to actually implementing an action plan and, and when it comes to um, real life implementation of the policy, um, that can be tricky for the governments and that's where sometimes, you know, policies just remain on the shelf and, and don't come into, into action. So we really thought that would be interesting to, to know and find out. In terms of effectiveness, um, we found that physical activity policies in only 16% of countries, so not a lot, were highly effective, were assessed as highly effective. In respect to um, sedentary behavior policy, that was in, in even a lower percentage, only in 10% of uh, countries, uh, while in 29, uh, countries, um, they were assessed as moderately effective. We did find significant differences in the effectiveness of physical activity policies by income levels. So they were more effective in uh, higher income countries. To conclude and hopefully leave us a bit more time for discussion and, and for your questions, I'm most of the analyzed countries, which we were happy about that we found that um, included, um, they had surveillance that includes uh, physical activity measures, they had quantifiable national targets, and they had uh, physical activity guidelines and also formal written policies, um, such as strategies or action plans. Um, However, as, as I said, um, effectiveness, implementation and comprehensiveness was assessed as low to moderate. So there needs to be more work done in that respect. And also they were generally less developed uh, policies, guidelines and, and targets. Everything was a bit less developed in uh, low and middle income countries, especially lower uh, middle income countries and low income countries. Upper middle income countries were actually pretty good in terms of um, comparison to higher income countries. And finally, um, as you can guess by now, sedentary behavior policies were less available, less implemented and less effective than uh, physical activity policies. So um, thank you so much for the interaction that we 
managed to have. And uh, thank you for spending your morning with me and with, with us. I hope at least some of the things from the presentation of the presentation were useful. And I'm really looking forward to your question and um, discussing this in, in more details. Also feel free to, I know my email is terribly long. I am uh, so, yeah, feel free to contact me uh, also through email. I'll pop in chat a shorter version of my email that will maybe be more effective. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks a million, Brianna, um, for a really, really enjoyable presentation. Um, we have one question there in the chat. Um, just uh, could you provide um, some more detail in terms of how implementation was assessed? Oh, yeah, definitely. I thought uh, we could discuss. Yeah. Uh, if you want so to answer that question now, and then we'll get, or... we'll get to be set up. Okay, yeah, I will just put up um, and also share my screen because I thought it would be useful to see the, um, uh, the policy inventory because uh, we, we explained there in more details um, how we define comprehensiveness, effectiveness and implementation uh, because that, that was a bit of um, discussion among GoPA team because uh, you know it's not something that you can objectively measure. Okay. Um, so let me if you um, just now if you, if you think it's better to leave till after Tepi's presentation yeah maybe if you just pull it out and then yeah. and then uh, I can share my screen again so okay, yeah perfect. Give Tepi the floor and then um okay uh Tepi we'll hand over to you okay oh, great thank you I've gone old school Bo I've gone powerpoint slides I'm, I'm always one step that? behind <laughs> <laughs> but then all these fancy moves and, and, and as I said, people said people are going to you know, fall asleep. So I was so afraid that that's going to happen that I decided I'll try and, to I'll try and not make you fall asleep. <laughs> um, okay, thank you um, for having us here today. Um, and so presentation title is Advocacy for ISPAR's Eight Investments That Work for Physical Activity. So um, thanks for the introduction at the start, Liam. Um, just briefly brush over this, but um, kind of wearing a few hats here. Um, so I am part of the International Society for Physical Activity and Health that developed the document, ISPAR's Eight Investments, um, but also wearing another few hats in terms of local advocacy um, in my town, Newcastle, uh, and also part of the Australasian Society for Physical Activity and Health. So. Um, there's a few bits and bobs that I'm pulling in here today. I'd, first question, uh, quick snap poll, just type one, to, one, two, three, or four, or five in the, in the chat box is how familiar are you with ISPAR's eight investments that work for physical activity? And I'll see if I can pull the chat up. You might have to read it back to me, uh, Liam. How are we looking? I can't get the chat box. Um, you have a wide range from, there's a couple of fives, a uh, couple of ones, a couple in the middle, three, two, uh, okay. four, four, yeah, so. Okay, yeah, a, all right, that's a, a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> that's a challenge. Um, well, hopefully there's a bit in it for everybody. Um, so I'm not just going to regurgitate the eight investments themselves, um, because uh, I'll point towards where you can go and read about those, um, but I will talk to each one of them um, briefly, but just a little bit first about the International Society for Physical Activity and Health. It's an international society for those people that are interested in advancing the science of and practice of physical activity and health. And they have led a number of things in physical activity advocacy in previous years. So an overview of what I'm going to talk about today is what actually is advocacy um, or, or how am I kind of looking at it um, and what have I learned about it in the last few years. Um, the role of advocacy for physical activity, uh, the context, the global advocacy context for physical activity, where, where do we sit? Uh, and this is very much kind of an international context and a global context, just ad acknowledging that there is a local context to this as well. Then around mobilizing consensus and why consensus is important. Then I'll touch a little bit on each of the eight investments, but like I say, I won't regurgitate each of them. 
And finally, I'm going to signpost to some practical tips and things that I found really useful as I've been learning about what advocacy is in the physical activity world and, and how it, um, you know, and some useful resources that are out there. So first up, what actually is advocacy? Well, advocacy is mobilizing influence to bring about change or a more detailed definition uh, from the World Health Organization focuses on political commitment, policy support, social acceptance and system support. Um, and, and it can be applied to physical activity in that way. So that doesn't really tell me, you know, what exactly uh, advocacy is, you know, it's always useful to start with a definition. Um, but here's a, a framework by um, Tre from Trevor Shilton that talks about uh, strategies that are used in advocacy for physical activity. So we've got five there. Uh, you've got political advocacy, which people often think about as being the first thing. Those engaging with ministers and writing uh, submissions. You've got media advocacy, um, which is engaging with media, um, positive media for physical activity. Professional mobilization, and that's around building a physical activity workforce. Community mobilization, how do we get people in the community to advocate for physical activity? We've got lots of people out there um, who are supporters of physical activity um, in some way. And then advocacy from within, so within our own organizations, what can we do? And so these are kind of the more expanded versions of those. Um, so what will win political commitment to uh, get, get physical activity policy and, and program actions? Well. The examples there, I won't read all of the examples out, but the examples are below each of the questions. These are just some of the types of strategies that are used in physical activity advocacy. Um, and so with media, what is what media coverage is driving the current opinion around physical activity? Is there support for 30 kilometers an hour residential zones or is there not in the media and um, that sort of thing? Uh, what, what is supporting the physical activity workforce uh, to advocate? So this, it would be an example of professional mobilization. So this webinar organized by Penn um, is, is a kind of training or a kind of um, knowledge sharing activity. But there's a few others there. Community mobilization. How do we get the community engaged uh, and supporting the, the overall goal for physical activity? And finally, what can we do from within? How can we work together um, better and, and, and share things um, between ourselves in, our, in the physical activity workforce? This is just a quick slide to say there's always something going on in physical activity advocacy. Um, this is one I've plucked from today's, uh, from my email inbox just a few hours ago that came in. Um, there's, this is an activity from um, promoting 30 kilometer an hour or 20 miles per hour. If you're in a um, old school country like the UK or um, the US. Um, the, and so like I say, there's always something going on. And you can check this one out. That's the, the latest one. So th there's a role for advocacy. And what is it? Well, we've got a stack of evidence. We know about the prevalence of physical activity. We know about um, what's been implemented and what's not been implemented. And, and Bo was talking to some of that. We've got all of the benefits around the co-benefits of physical activity in for the sustainable development goals, for, for example. We know what interventions work. Um, we know the economic benefits of physical activity. And we also know what, to some extent, what people think about different policy options uh, from market research. Then in the middle, we've got um, less so, but we've got all of these reports being generated um, and policies that perhaps are more written, but not perhaps implemented. Uh, so blueprints and reviews and summaries. And then we've got at the end, well, where are we? Where, where's the commitment? Where, why, are we not, why are we not doing it? Why is it not improving? And that's the, the policy commitment. And this is where advocacy sits, is, is trying to get policy commitment around actions. So the global advocacy context for physical activity, well, the first thing to say is that um, you could have a thousand slides on this one, um, but we know that physical activity is good for health. We know it has economic benefits, social and environmental benefits. This image on the right shows the benefits for the sustainable development goals. 
um, specifically 13 of those uh, physical activity um, plays a part in. So physical activity has wide ranging effects. We, we, we know that and, and people on this call are very familiar with that. We'll also be familiar, I would imagine, with the new 2020 WHO uh, guidelines on physical activity and sedentary behaviour and the WHO's global action plan on physical activity as well, which outlines 20 policy actions um, across four strategic objectives. So there's plenty going on in the global physical activity space. <clears throat> and this is just trying to gear, gear up the presentation to, so where does the eight investments sit and, and why was it needed? Uh, here's another one, of course, the Global Observatory for Physical Activity uh, that uh, Bo was talking about. Um, has produced 160 country report cards uh, with detailed data on, for, for each country, which are a fantastic resource. So we know a lot um, and we know where we've been and where we're going. We know that the research evidence is building up all the time. Um, so what, what, how do we mobilize change and consensus? Sorry, how do we mobilize consensus and why is that important? This is about singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, this is about making sure that we're all uh, aware of what works um, and, and a common voice. And that's something that we've learned from the um, tobacco control. So these are some lessons from the, that have been learned uh, from tobacco control. There's a, an anecdote that um, Trevor Shilton often um, says when he's presenting, which is that if you phone up any of the leading tobacco control people in the world and any of the 15 top tobacco control, they'll all give you the same answer as to what needs to be done um, to improve uh, and reduce tobacco. So we're perhaps not quite there with physical activity uh, and we've got a way to go and, we, and we're getting closer, um, but agreeing on what works is, is the consensus idea. So these are a few of the lessons learned, and this is from um, Yak and colleagues uh, published in the BMJ. So we need clear leadership, and that is probably a small team of people that are persistent, media savvy, uh, and politically astute. We're looking to build coalitions between um, different groups. So that might be regional networks, that might be working in different areas of the eight investments when we come to look at those. Uh, and it's emphasizing that it's a systems approach and that, you know, it's not all about individual behavior change. There is, uh, there is other stuff obviously going on with physical activity, the built environment um, uh, and some of the other eight investments. Evidence alone is in, insufficient for policy change. We're all fully aware of that, but keeping that in our minds and same with implementation, that we need to fully implement effective interventions that we know will work. One key learning from tobacco is that that it didn't happen overnight and that it takes persistence. And finally, and where this, um, I suppose where this is the most important for this presentation is that building consensus and building global co consensus around um, a comprehensive intervention pa package and a plan and an agreed plan. So that's um, where the eight investments sit. So if you're not familiar um, with ISPAR's previous works. Um, in 2010, ISPAR released the Toronto Charter for Physical Activity, um, which has been a really widely cited document uh, and uh, for, for physical activity advocacy. Building off the 2010 Toronto Charter, when that was launched, um, there was the uh, seven investments that work for physical activity published in 2011, and that was a response to the need for solutions. So there was a call to say, we need to know what works. And so the International Society of Physical Activity and Health came up with those seven, seven investments, and that was subsequently turned into a, an infographic you can see there on the right-hand side, which has also been really widely cited. So ISPAR's done a heck of a lot more than that, but that's just its kind of documents and consensus documents quick overview but the eight investments um, that were physical activity was a, a 2020 update to the seven investments 
So the eight investments that work or colloquially sometimes known as the eight best investments, um, they emphasize that there's no single solution and that the crux of that is that no single investment of part of these eight investments will shift the needle. None of them will look, work alone and they're expected to work in combinations um, to reach a systems-based approach. And what they provide is an overview of evidence which can be used to advocate, um, inform and lead physical activity discussion. So the, they're a nice summary of the research, but also give um, some of the, they can help lead that policy and discussion. The main call to action across the whole document is for everybody everywhere, professionals, academics, civil society and decision makers to embed physical activity in national and subnational policies. So it's a big call to action, um, but it's a big document. Um, so what I'm going to do is just briefly introduce eight of the investments. We'd be here all night if, um, or all day for you guys um, if I went into each one in detail. So the eight investments can be found on the ISPAR website. Um, if, if you go to ispar.org and, and, and from there, you'll be able to find them off our homepage. So the first one, is uh, whole of school programs. These are not in any particular order around importance. Um, they're in uh, essentially a random order, um, but schools comes first. And schools is around engaging ho uh, whole school communities and taking a whole of school approach. Um, and there's a number of things as part of whole school programs. And that's what my um, PhD has been in, has been working with schools. Um, so focusing on active PE uh, and um, safe, enjoyable PE, built environments in the schools. So having playgrounds and, uh, and environments that support schools and around the schools, having available resources, um, active travel around schools, school policies for physical activity. And really the crux of it is emphasizing a whole of school approach. So not just implementing one single thing and hoping it will work. Uh, here's a lovely picture to see what you can do with a, an environment. Um, thanks to um, Dr. Lindsay Reese for this one. Um, but you can see that the playgrounds change um, quite considerably when you can change the environment around the school. So the second one, the second investment is active travel. And it's around supportive transport policies and inducing demand for active travel rather than inducing demand for car travel you might have heard of induced demand um, before and emphasizing the the multiple co-benefits for sustainable development goals particularly for active travel um, and there's some cities doing this around the world um, Melbourne for instance for example is working on 20 minute neighborhood um, and wherever you are in the world there seems to be something going on uh, with active travel the latest one today that I've seen is the the uh, hashtag love 30 from th that I was looking at before. The third investment is active urban design. And this is around uh, supportive building designs, support supportive places that people can be within. So creating ap appealing places to be in. And there's a number of things, uh, a number of reports out there to support active urban design. Um, and, and street design specifically as well. So uh, there's ample amounts of stuff that can support us. It's now about getting this into, into place. The fourth one is healthcare. And we've got um, particularly strong evidence around short and um, brief uh, advice given by in, within um, the healthcare setting. So this is around health professionals giving that advice for both the prevention and management of disease. Um, the WHO Europe group there promoting physical activity in the health sector talks more to that specific one um, as, a, as a fact sheet there. But I think the, the healthcare ones are, are really commonly known best by. Um, the fifth one is public education, including mass media. So this includes a lot of different types of media, so digital media, social media. Um, there seems to be uh, a, a 
a trend for it to work better if messages are, are portrayed as being positive. So rather than portraying negative messages around physical activity, so framing physical activity positively and making sure that the messages are clear and raising the awareness of physical activity's importance. Some, um, I've just grabbed a few of those from the Love 30 campaign there. This one on the left-hand side from Change for Life in the UK. Could you get off the bus stop? Uh, could you get off the bus one stop earlier is a common one um, that's been in, out there. Of course, the kind of messages change over time. There's a shift currently away from using the term sit less because it has negative connotations um, for those people living with disabilities. So I think this, this feels really interesting in terms of the types of messages that are being put out. Um, WHO went with be active um, as their kind of main leading one. The sixth one is sport and recreation for all. So this is the one that um, I helped Lindy Reese write. Um, so we worked on this one together. This is around sport, not just being for the elite, but being something that is accessible for um, everybody. And um, that's the, there's many things that can contribute to that. And people can contribute to sport in many different ways. So that might be playing, but it might also be um, refereeing and, and um taking part in different ways. So this is about being across the lifespan, not just um, when people are younger and also contributes to many of the sustainable development goals in a slightly different way to active travel, I would say. Um, workplaces, and this is a, similar to the school setting around um, opportunities to be active throughout, embedded throughout the day. And um, there's multiple benefits for physical, mental and social health, but for workplaces, the draw card would probably be absenteeism and burnout. And finally, is around combining these approaches. Um, so the previous seven, combining bits of these together and working towards a systems-based approach um, so that we can realize those co-benefits to, to physical activity. Physical activities, interactions, and the way that um, these eight investments work. So that's the inner blue ring of the crazy diagram on the right. We know that um, there's lots of things going on. And, um, you know, if you nudge one place in the system, it has effects in other places. So I think this is this is the way it's going and community wide approaches. That's why it's a really important um, investment for the eight investments. So that was a whirlwind tour um, of the eight investments. And I would recommend that, you know, read the full document. That's what it's there for. Um, but it does give you an overview and a frame um, for people to talk about each of the eight different investments. So I'm going to go pretty quickly through these last few, just to say that we have an, an advocacy toolkit. And that toolkit is on the um, ISPAR website. And it has tons of stuff to um, support advocates for physical activity. And we can all be advocates for physical activity, whatever our job role is. Um, however, um, junior, senior we are. So uh, there's an animation video, an infographic, there's podcasts on each of the eight investments and by the authors of the lead, the lead authors of each investment area. There are social media graphics. You can endorse the eight investments as an individual or you can organize for your organization to endorse the eight investments um, and get your logo on the ISPAR website as endorsing the eight investments. Uh, which reminds me, we probably have to get onto pen to, to get you guys up and running. Um, and finally, uh, we've got many different translations into different languages and, uh, and also an audio book version. So there is no arguments um, for uh, getting this one. You can listen to the whole eight investments document as an audio book. So just wrapping up really with some final practical advocacy tips. You can send this to your colleagues. You can distribute it through your organization. Why not send it to your boss and other decision makers um, if you're working outside of the research space? Uh, if you're speaking with media, it's great to, um, if you're talking on a particular topic, you can lean on the eight investments to think what are the other areas of physical activity? And you can join the conversation 
um, on social media using the hashtag 8investments. Our call to action, if you didn't get any of that, is one, share, two, endorse the document, and three, send us some feedback via um, hashtag 8investments. Some final things, if you're really interested in advocacy and wanting to know more, I found this really useful recently. Um, this is a document from Public Health Institute Western Australia, but has relevance broad, broader than Australia, and it's a practical guide to advocacy. I would also take a look at Trevor Shilton's framework for physical activity advocacy. This, I talked about um, advocacy strategies, but there's plenty of other stuff um, in here. Uh, and uh, I would, yeah, very much encourage you to look at that. Um, we, if you've been working um, to try and share your research articles better, um, and we've been working on a roadmap for your journal article. So giving you ideas of what you can do pre-submission of your journal article, pre-acceptance, pre-publication and post-publication. So for those people working in research, there is a, a roadmap and then there's kind of explanatories on the back of that roadmap. And you can get that from, from here. Um, and that was with um, Ben Elton. Um, uh, I think finally, uh, if you're an early career professional, which I think most of us are, the ISPART Early Career Network published this um, role for early career professionals in advocating, disseminating and implementing the global action plan. So that might be a, a, a nice starting place. And I know um, the, the Penn Early Career Network have already um, been onto that, which is great. Finally, I've got to do a plug because I'm the ISPAR comms person and it wouldn't be right if I didn't. So if, uh, if you're not a, a member of ISPAR yet, you can join up. And um, for those that do know who Del Boy is, um, I've got you a discount code. Uh, so you can use this discount code until the end of this month. So you've got about a week. Uh, ISPAR Early Bird 2021, get you 20% off. There are some of the references. I'll leave that up just for a second. Um, but yeah, happy to take any questions and we'll, we'll work together on those, Bo. Okay, uh, excellent presentation topic. Um, I think everyone will agree both presentations were very, very informative and there was a lot of information in both. Um, with that in mind, the session is recorded and we will be posting it up on the Penn website in in the near future, and Tepe has agreed that it, it posted up on ISPA's uh, platforms as well, so it will be available on, on both platforms. Um, there's a few questions there in the chat box. I think Alexia is just going to run through a few of them and, and post them yeah. to you. Yeah, thank you both for really informative and interesting presentations. Um, well, the first question is the one that we mentioned earlier uh, for Bayana about implementation and how you assessed implementation. Yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen again uh, just to show you the inventory uh, and share some of our struggles we had with that. But uh, we did decide eventually how to. Okay, can you see the yeah. inventory or yeah? Yeah. Um. So that was this this question. Uh, we tried to explain it and not not to go into too extensive explanation. So we did say that it, include, it, it includes uh, translating statements, ideas, goals, or objectives mentioned in the policy documents and translating them into the practice. Uh, I think in, in the chat, Tepi and Anna, uh, I think mentioned that you know policies um, don't work without implementation. So we thought it would be really relevant to ask that. And then we um, added an, an example, what, what can that mean? And then we asked the country context to estimate to what extent do they think um, the policy was implemented. And we asked them to provide, and that answers another question um, that was in the, in the chat. So we asked them to provide um, the resources, um, whether it was gray literature or any kind of publication that informed their answer. And a lot of country context did that. So. Um, which in, in a way um, means that their, that information was, was credible. Um, so it was technical reports, publication, uh, journal articles, um, great literature, um, evaluation reports, a lot of different types of documents that were shared with us uh, that informed their answer. Okay, great. 
great. Thank you. That's quite a comprehensive answer. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions for Tepi. Um, one is from me, actually, um, asking in advocacy, how important is it to wait for a policy window or do you just need to be consistently persistent and not wait for these opportunities? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? I think, um, I know that Trevor Shilton has called this the advocacy a science and an art. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, the art of finding the policy window and the right timing for to do advocacy. But on the other side of that, um, the persistency side is around the relationships and the partnerships that you can build. So that is part of that framework that um, Trevor's made there. And I think persistence in creating and managing those partnerships and because physical activity has so many different, well, it's got eight different investment areas. Um, there, there's so many different partners that we can have. So, yeah, I think from that side of it, it's about persistence generally and forming relationships and working with, but then also being opportunistic um, and jumping on the on board. And I think COVID was a good example of that in especially in Australian context at least there was a lot of um, pop-up cycle waste that occurred as a just as an example um, and that was through some concerted advocacy efforts uh, from uh, Dr Ben Beck who led a, a movement called Space for Health so that's just one example of yeah where we had that um, kind of window of opportunity where it there was a bit of shining of light on that particular issue um, and the politicians were interested, the media was interested, and things seemed to work together. Okay, great. So you can only really react to the policy window if you have these this persistent approach as well. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, locally, if I go right down to the local level where we are in Newcastle, mm -hmm. there's there's not a lot we could do in being reactive if we didn't have those relationships set up. Mm -hmm. So I know that a lot of people aren't necessarily that interested as much in their local um stuff oh i think everybody has a general interest in what's going on around them um but if you do get involved in local advocacy i think it's very much um managing partnerships and relationships and it might not be as formal as those international ones where it's about sharing logos and um memorandums of understanding and all of that sort of stuff it's more about oh do you want to go down for a coffee and let's chat about um you know with your local councillor or that type of thing it, yeah, so there's, there's partnerships can be quite different depending on what level, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, is physical activity uh, the only target? Uh, is physical activity as the only target really enough or do we also have to combine it with healthy nutrition education? So is it um, possible to only yeah. physical I actually thought about that's a good one. I, I thought about putting that in the context section to where physical activity sits, because of course it does sit within a context of obesity, other public health issues, nutrition. Um, so, yeah, I think it does sit within that as the short answer. Great, thank you. And we have a question there from Joy um, for for Bo. Uh, do you find similar good practices or did you find similar good practices within policies in different countries and could these, these be used to help others begin the process of agenda setting and formulation within or with the uh, policy? Well, Joey, you just posed um, another research project question and um, unfortunately due to the limitation of a PhD uh, in four years, um, that wasn't my fifth study, but that would be something that I think is definitely worth pursuing because we, we didn't have the time to analyze the content of policies. So we just um, were informed by what experts told us uh, from their own countries, but that would actually be great if someone um, went into all these documents that are that are publicly available and analyze them and then, um, then pulled out the best practices. So maybe you, Joey, can take up that project or, <laughs> or, or someone else from this group. It's a, it's a fantastic idea, but unfortunately we didn't do it. Thank you. I think we have one uh, last question that I see, which is from Beatrice. He's going to ask um, over video. Yeah. Uh, 
Hi, Catherine. I think you just wanted to say a few words, sir. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Do you, do you want me to go now, or is, Be or is Beatrice next? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, you both have the same name, that's why I was confused. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. Sorry. I, 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 first of all, I just wanted to say a really big thank you to Bo and Tepi on behalf of the PEN coordinating team. Um, I think it was excellent, and, and Tepi, a great idea to link with the PEN network in relation to the eight best investments and bring it, so we'll use this as an introduction, we're also working with them on the physical activity epi tool, but we will absolutely, we, we need to advance that in a more formal way. So that's a great idea. But thank you both two really, really superb presentations. I'm going to ask you a general question for the network more so than for your topic. And knowing what you know now about PhDs and starting a career in this area, what advice might you give to um, a young researcher, either in the policy field or in the advocacy or the school based field? What piece of advice might you give them to them about uh, going forward in this area? I actually had a similar question and I'll just add to that. Um, oh, sorry, as, as an early uh, careers researcher, um, I obviously got to, to meet you guys. Um, through attending conferences and, and getting to know you in that capacity. That's obviously not available to early careers researchers at the moment. So yeah, just to add to, to Catherine's question, um, yeah, what advice would you give to early careers researchers? I might, yeah, I'll go first. If, um, I'm not good with formal answers to those type of questions, more off the record type answers um, in a way. Um, but I think getting involved and having a practice if it's advocacy um, because the skill set for advocacy that I'm still developing um, is massive and crazy and really fun to learn um, and there's so many different strategies in advocacy and only starting to touch on a few of them I would just say if that is something that interests you uh, that I would just dive in make a few mistakes along the way um, and, and learn from that and the, and the second thing's around Liam's one, which is around networking. Um, and the, that's been really difficult during COVID. This has been great um, because there's been, you know, little bits of interactivity, which has been really good, but it's no replacement for face-to-face. -face. So I think um, to some extent, locally at least, when when restrictions start to ease, I think we, we're, you know, building face-to-face -face relationships back up again is my top tip for local advocacy. That's great, Tepi. Thanks for that. Uh, Bo, do you have anything you'd like to? Yeah, I, um, I would say it's really important and I find it important now and I find found it important then is to, to somehow be engaged in, in research translation practices, because we often find, and, and Tepi had that as, as part of his presentation, that, you know, we do this research, we spend a lot of time doing it, especially with, you know, PhD, that it's a four-year big project that you invest a lot of your time and energy and, um, you know, you go up and down with um, everything you're going through, and then um, nothing happens. And, you know, you can't get it out there. It's hard to communicate the message. Even now I'm asking myself, you know, was I clear? Did, did this audience understand a let alone maybe audience that is less informed? So I think we do still need to, as a, as a research community, do a lot of work in that respect in, in the actual implementation of research. Like we talk about policy implementation, but similar applies to research because unfortunately a lot of it just remains there in, in, and we know about it, but, but those that are decision makers they, or pr practitioners, they don't. Uh, so I think there should be some strengthening in that respect and you know, maybe, maybe through PEN and, and other um, networks, if we can all get together on that front, maybe we can do something about that as well. Uh, mm. In terms of your question, Liam, I agree. Yeah, sorry. Tepi, did you want to oh, say I was only going to say on, on that, Bo, like that, that, that's exactly what we tried to do here in Newcastle was to try and get a little bit better at knowledge translation, which is what we called it, but trying to get better at putting 
our research out there in different formats, in different engaging with different stakeholders. And, and that the report that I've just popped in the chat is a two pager. And well, it's actually a one page of the first page. And it's just a roadmap that guides um, different knowledge translation activities that you might want to do along the way in your journal article. And on the back of that, it has the detailed explanations of how to do each one. But if anybody wants to have a chat about those, happy to. Well, I would definitely. <laughs> So. Yeah, we we sure that this is yeah. Share ideas. This is what it's about. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I know it's hard to stay connected in in this uh, time of you know because especially as Liam said, we did meet uh, in person, and it's easier to form that those connections. And as I was saying from the start, it, it's just awkward to talk like this you know when you don't know what what are people's reactions i don't know whether you laugh or you know you're serious and you're looking at me in a weird way or you know do you understand what i'm talking about um so not having that is i think a specific challenge that we'll have to um deal with and i hope we'll find new and creative ways of you know bridging that gap that that is um here at the moment and you know who knows when we're going to be able to actually go to conference in person yeah um look forward to face-to-face -face meetings returning um just if anyone has any other questions uh, please feel free to ask and can i ask that people turn on their cameras um and that we just take a kind of screenshot of of the event that we'd like to post up something on twitter thanks it's nice to see the faces uh, behind the names. Yeah. So thanks for doing that. Joey's got his laptop shut. <laughs> that's asleep. all right. <laughs> oh, th th that's better. <laughs> um, th also, yeah, I mean, thank you very much for having us, by the way. It's been really good to, to share. You know, Absolutely. And, and even uh, if anybody, an yeah. As an early yeah. career to do this um i think that's that's really important so thank you ben um i hope you'll continue doing that um no thank thank you both for for giving up your time and, and your evening um it's really enjoyable and yeah on behalf of the pen acn and and pen in general i uh, just want to thank you and, and thank everyone for attending um i posted up where our next webinar is due to take place the end of April. Um, there will be details circulated, and yeah. So yeah, I think we'll leave it there for now, and yeah, I'll hopefully see you all soon uh, through the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.